Welcome back everyone to the Underground Church Channel. Today I'm going to show you guys some of the strongest proofs why there is more than one set of good news in Scripture and we are going to address the opposing arguments against this so that you guys can see with crystal clarity which side is right. So John chapter 20, this is after Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again from the dead. Remember, that is the gospel of the grace of God. Have the people of God always believed in the same gospel throughout all spans of time? Let's see. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene. Here's Mary. She cometh early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. O oh, glory God, he rose from the dead as we all have been placing our faith on that he would do. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple. There's three of them now. This other disciple as well, whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre and we know not where they have laid him. Let's continue here. Peter, therefore, went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together. Why are you guys running? Don't you guys know what just happened? You all collectively, Israel nationally, has been placing their faith on this for a long time. It's the same gospel. Come on now. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. Wow, they're going really fast. What happened to our Lord? We don't know. And came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Wow, that looks quite, hmm, what could that mean? Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and he saw, watch this, and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture. Let me read that again. For as yet, who? They knew not the scripture, knew not that he must rise again from the dead. Then, who? Who are the they that we were just referring to? Then the disciples went away again unto their home. Also, watch this. What is Mary doing? But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. Why is she weeping? Come on, we've all been waiting for this, Israel, right? And she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet. Oh, now we gotta know. The angels are at the head and the feet, come on now. Right where, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Anybody catch that little bit of a joke there? It's like the angels have a bit of a sense of humor. Shouldn't you guys know this? But you don't. That's what the word of God says. Now, she saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord. Oh, he didn't just resurrect from the dead. And watch this. I know not where they have laid him. She thinks he's still dead. Okay. Now, folks, let me go ahead and open up this little amazing document right here. And let's read. Even by the time of the empty tomb, meaning Christ had now done it in front of them. The information contained in what we call the gospel of the grace of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4, correct? Let's read what I put here. Who doesn't know the gospel of the grace of God by the time it was already accomplished? According to Luke chapter 18, which we read last time, the twelve apostles and the disciples did not know while they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, meaning they are not the same thing. Now, the response from many on the side of the fence who are typically covenant theology, replacement theology, amillennial, etc., depending, they will typically say something like, in Luke chapter 18, when Jesus blatantly told all twelve the gospel of the grace of God, and it says, they didn't know it, they didn't understand it, and the saying was hid from them. Threefold, they didn't know this gospel. They will try to claim something like, well, maybe the apostles had some earwax in their ears at that one singular moment of time. It just went over their heads. But come on, the gospel has always been the same. That is, that is the gospel of the kingdom that they were preaching. Come on, it just went over their heads for a second. Never mind the fact that Jesus had to turn to Peter and say, get thee behind me, Satan, because Peter was trying to stop the gospel of the grace of God from happening while Peter was with the rest of them preaching the gospel of the kingdom. But folks, definitive proof right here in John chapter 20 that it was not just a singular lapse, a singular moment of forgetfulness or earwax in the ears of all 12 
that they misheard Jesus, which is not what the text says. It says they didn't know what he said. They didn't understand what he said. They didn't know the gospel of the grace of God. How many? All 12. This absence of knowledge, this not knowing, continued from that singular moment. It was not just a moment where they all made a mistake. We see that this unknowing, this ignorance of theirs, of the gospel of the grace of God, continued all the way through Jesus actually doing it in front of them. Then he was buried. Now the tomb is empty. He has resurrected, and they still don't know. What does it say, folks? Does it say they were being forgetful? No, it says... For as yet they knew not the scriptures that he must rise again from the dead. This, in addition to numerous other passages across scripture, is one of the strongest evidences for progressive revelation. That is, that scripture can be written down, but the general understanding of the people will lag behind what God, as the divine author, intended that to mean. This is why you have a lot of preterists, etc., that get stuck in a narrow, pigeonholed interpretation, trying to look only through the lens of the human author. The problem is you have a divine author that supersedes, that supervises the scriptures. That's why we ultimately call this God's word, not man's word. What would separate this from any other book in the world if it was just man's word? And at our seminaries, we put all of the emphasis on just studying the perspective of the human author and what the human author was thinking. You see, God is supervising the Word of God. Now, let's address some of the arguments that neglect and exclude this information in order to pigeonhole themselves on some kind of silly traditions of men, erroneous, false doctrine. I said it, interpretation of Scripture. They are trying to claim, no, the gospel was always the same. There's only one gospel in the Bible. That is not what Galatians chapter 1 says. Galatians chapter 1 is talking to a specific audience, the body of Christ, and the context is that Paul is worried about them going back under a works-based gospel. In no way, shape, or form does this override or replace the gospel of the kingdom for Israel and their kingdom in the land, which will go into the new earth. We know that there will be other kings from around the new earth which will come and visit the kingdom in Israel, we will have different kingdoms for all of these different Gentile nations around the world. It would be very strange if the entire new earth was just the land of Israel, the kingdom of Israel. God is a God of diversity. Look how much diversity there is in the angels. Look how much diversity there is in creation, all the way from your strong and weak nuclear force, radioactive decay, down to the quantum level. Who seems to know the gospel of the grace of God then? according to the other side. Notice how I said who seems to know because we cannot even definitively conclude that they knew the gospel of the grace of God. Number one, John the Baptist. Okay, we know this. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, here's the thing, folks. Does that mean that John understood he had to resurrect three days later? We don't know. We just know that John said Jesus was the sacrificial lamb. However, there's another thing that could be a possibility, and that is that the Holy Spirit was speaking through John, prophesying that Jesus had come in that moment. Perhaps John didn't even understand what was coming out of his mouth. It's a possibility we don't know for 100% certain. And if we don't know something for certain, that means we take clearer statements which actually comment on what they know, what they understand. First, before we look at what John the Baptist said, and we have no idea how much understanding he possessed of those words of that declaration which came out of his mouth. On top of that, even if he did understand every word that came out of his mouth, that Jesus was the sacrificial lamb, none of that says anything about the cross. None of that says anything about, watch this, the resurrection. So. Even John the Baptist, who says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. This is one of the proof texts that people will jump on when they're trying to say the gospel was always the same. No, even if we give them all of the benefit of the doubt, what does that prove? Because we have to include all of the information of Scripture. We cannot just erase these other passages so we can see here, what does it mean? It means that the 12 apostles and the disciples did not know, but if they are right, if, that means that John the Baptist knew and everybody else didn't know. Let's continue here and let me show you guys something. 
It has also been claimed that perhaps a few from the sect of the Jews called the Essenes knew essentially the same thing that John the Baptist knew. It's speculated that John the Baptist was actually an Essene. However, we see here that while the Essenes might have known more of what to expect that was to come, we still have to maintain scripture. We cannot erase these passages from scripture. The 12 apostles did not know. The disciples did not know. Somehow, the ones closest to Jesus that he picked out didn't know the gospel of the grace of God while they were preaching another one. So, Abraham, oh James, oh James, this debunks your entire viewpoint. It says that God preached the gospel to Abraham. So going all the way back to Abraham, everybody knew. In fact, we cannot even conclude that the gospel preached to Abraham was the same gospel of the grace of God. And let me prove that here today, folks. Okay, let's go here to Galatians chapter 3. And let's read down here in verse 8. It says, And the scripture, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, This is the good news that God said to Abraham. Because what did it just say, folks? It said, the scripture, meaning we have to find this in the scriptures. We cannot speculate outside of them. Watch this. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify who? Who, folks? The heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations, the heathen, be blessed. That was the good news God preached to Abraham. In fact, you can go back in what? scripture and prove that what is not in scripture if you go back and read it what we cannot find in scripture that god says to abraham the good news god says to him is the gospel of the grace of god now i understand they're going to go back to the typology of abraham offering up isaac and abraham says god will provide himself a lamb now, just because Abraham said that does not mean that Abraham understood he was undergoing a typology kind of a ceremony that was representing their Messiah that was going to come later on. Nowhere in that passage does it say that, neither does it infer that. We can look back and we can draw that understanding from it because we have post-knowledge after the cross. Abraham did not. We cannot conclude because scripture does not say anything about that that Abraham understood the kind of typology he was partaking in. In fact, if you try to say he did, that defeats the purpose of God putting Abraham through that test of faith, placing Isaac on the altar to begin with anyways, because that would mean Abraham was in on it from the beginning with God. Then what's the point? Because after Abraham did that, we know another scripture was fulfilled and Abraham was called the friend of God. Because in James chapter 2, which has a context of men earning other men's trust, right? We see that Abraham earned God's trust as a friend when he passed that test of faith, when he offered up Isaac on the altar. How can that be the case if Abraham was in on it because he knew he was performing a typology ceremony? He knew the gospel of the grace of God before it even began. And that's why he said, God will provide himself a lamb. No, that's probably not why Abraham said that. Abraham probably did not understand that he was performing a typology ceremony. And even if we give them the benefit of the doubt across the board, I'm being as lenient as possible, leaning towards these covenant theologians, etc. In these times of mass apostasy and biblical ignorance and the disrespect of the traditional classical dispensationalists, who did not have TV or radio to distract them, but all day long sat there and studied the Word of God, unlike today with our fast-paced, spoiled smartphone generation. Just saying, guys. Just saying. Okay, look. Let's take a look here, okay? So let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say John the Baptist knew the gospel of the grace of God, but really not all of it. We can't conclude that. Let's say the few from the Essenes, a sect of the Jews, knew what to expect along with John the Baptist when Christ was coming. Let's say that Father Abraham knew the gospel of the grace of God. If we do not exclude scripture in favor of our oversimplified desire to try and put God in a box and say we have it all figured out. No, we need to allow the complexities in scripture to elevate our understanding up to God's level, not try and drag God's big way of doing things down to our tiny way of trying to oversimplify everything and put it all under one umbrella. We have to include all of scripture. So. 
Even if Abraham and John the Baptist knew, and maybe some of the Essenes, the rest of them clearly did not know. None of the twelve apostles knew, and the disciples did not know. Therefore, watch this guys, therefore, I have a question, therefore, was the shared custom and the foundation of Israel's faith, the foundation, was it to look forward to the moments when Christ would come die on the cross for their sins and resurrect the third day? No, here's why. No, since this would have been the first thing they'd all teach their children as the foremost fundamental of the faith. Meaning, pretty much everyone in Israel from childhood would have already shared this same basic knowledge. So, how were they saved? You see, because people cannot draw an oversimplified conclusion for something like this, that's why they're going to lean back on some kind of a milk level amateur understanding. Eh, just swipe the back of your hand away at it. I don't want to think about this, right? Let's just keep it simple. Let's lie about the Bible and just say it's all the same. It's all one gospel everywhere. Really? How about we go with a professional like the late great Dr. Charles Ryrie? To agree with Dr. Ryrie, God used their faith in whatever amount of knowledge was revealed to their understanding at the time and accounted it to them for righteousness. This has been James at the Underground Church Channel. If you gained anything from watching, remember to like, share, and subscribe with the bell. Christian channels like ours deal with shadow banning often, so if you want this info to reach others, the teaching's on me, but it's up to you to spread it. And remember, check out our playlist section for no-nonsense, binge-worthy teachings, and amazing things you never hear at church or seminary. For instance, Pre-Trib versus Pre-Wrath, the Ultimate series addresses the most cutting-edge arguments on the Rapture and thoroughly debunks the rising alternative view. We've received much positive feedback via email, messenger, and comments professing breakthroughs and doctrinal clarity from watching our playlists. That said, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.